I want to welcome you to this teaching moment from Generations Christian Church. My name is Johnny Scott. I'm the senior pastor here at Generations. And one of my mentors told me long ago, as very young in ministry, he told me, so Johnny, the, the job of preaching, the job of a preacher at a local church is to whet the appetite of all, everyone in the congregation for the Word of God. I really hope that in these next few moments as we dive into a text and see how God's Word is alive and active, that one thing happens, that you get hungry for the Lord. And here's what happens in, in that process. Uh, G Jesus is going to have you pour yourself out so he can pour himself into you. See, the less of ourselves we have, the more room, the more capacity we have in our lives for God to pour in. It's someone that's completely full of themselves that says, I'm not hungry for God. To get hungry for God, the first thing you've got to do is pour out everything that you have so you're an empty vessel waiting to be poured into. That's my prayer for you as we walk into this teaching time, whether you're going to listen to it on a podcast or you're catching up in the week, uh, wherever you're at during this moment, would you become lesser so that God can become greater in you. It's going to give you joy and you're going to get more from this teaching time if that's your mindset as you walk into this. You know, one other thing I want to tell you before we dive into this teaching is this. Uh, I, I grew up a kid going to uh, the local church. It was a local church with a, a youth pastor and a group of elders and volunteers at that church that transformed my life in really one of the, the deepest, darkest times of, of my story. And I still believe that the local church is God's plan for the salvation of the world. So if you are a, consider yourself a, a vital part of Generations Christian Church, and maybe you're on vacation with your family and you're going to watch online or you're, you're catching up doing a workout, I, I want to say this. Make sure that you're involved. Make sure you're involved in church because you can get content from so many places, but what God wants for you is to be a part of a local church where you're serving and you're giving and you're pouring into what God is doing there because there's more for you than just hearing a message. And there's going to be something I'm sure great in this message that the Spirit of God is going to use to transform your life, but you're missing out on a larger part if you're not really involved. And so if you're not in close proximity to Generations Christian Church and you're enjoying this teaching and it's being meaningful in your life, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Praise God for that. We're so excited to be able to bless you in this way. But I would, I would encourage you, find a church around you that you can serve and give at because that's God's ultimate plan is for all of us to be a part of the church because that's the bride that he's coming back for one day. Thanks for being with us today and may God use this teaching to bless your life. Okay. Hi, my name is Kylie and I'm here to share my testimony um, about my sister. It was April 26th of 2009. It was a Saturday um, and we had gone to a friend's house and we were just riding four wheelers just like a regular day. And my dad was on one of the four, four wheelers with my sister and I was on with one of the family friends and we decided that we were going to go near a hill and they went up the hill and um, the four-wheeler stalled and they had actually rolled down the hill and it wasn't until after we had heard my dad yelling for me and the family friend that we realized that there was a major problem. And um, we found my dad and my sister under the four-wheeler. My dad was frantic and me and the family friend had driven back at almost 100 miles an hour to the house to kind of explain to them what was going on. And my mom and my dad and the other family friend had driven um, a pickup truck up to the site because they couldn't get an ambulance out there. It was a remote area. And they loaded my sister into the truck um, and took her to a local hospital, not really knowing what was wrong. but. She was flushed, she just was in and out of consciousness and we knew there was something wrong. So they get to the hospital and they're 
Cricken and prying her with needles and everything, just trying to figure out the extent of her injuries. And they didn't specialize in pediatrics, so they weren't really sure. And it was in the middle of a thunderstorm, so they couldn't really get um, a helicopter to take her out to the pediatric ICU, which was about 30, 45 minutes from where we initially were. And so they're in the hospital and my parents are pleading with them and telling them that she's basically going to die and they need someone to do something as quickly as possible. And it wasn't until an ambulance had pulled in and one of the paramedics had seen my sister and it was actually an off shift. So the ambulance driver, the EMTs weren't even really supposed to take my sister, but this lady, which we believe was an angel sent from God, had loaded up my sister and they took her out to the pediatric ICU and they figured out very quickly that she had um, a broken femur, she had internal bleeding, she had a severed liver, um, a severed pancreas, uh, her lungs were all the way up basically in her throat. Um, and the doctors had told my parents to basically prepare for the worst and at this point, I was with my grandparents and my two brothers, so we had no idea if my sister was even gonna make it. I didn't know if I'd even get to say goodbye to my sister. Um, and then, you know, the doctor had said, if she doesn't have a quarter of her pancreas, she's just not gonna survive at all. And when they had opened her up and they found a quarter of her pancreas, which was just a miracle from God, there's no other way to describe it, but a pure miracle. So she was on life support for about two weeks. Um, she had rods put into her legs and we were part of a church at the time in Pennsylvania. Um, so there was a lot of just prayer chain going around, you know, lifting up my sister in prayer, just knowing what our God can do. And he surely pulled through for my sister. And there's two songs that I distinctly remember we put a CD together for. And to this day, these two songs have so much heavy meaning. and. I know that they definitely could reach out to other people and they are um, how great is our God and praise you in this storm. Um, praise you in this storm, it just really describes the entire story, you know. I'll praise you in this storm, I will lift my head, you know, no matter what because he holds every tear and even though it hurts, you know, we know that our God is great and in prayer it changes everything and I'm so excited to see what prayer will do for our church. I don't know if you uh, noticed, but Kylie was uh, baptized earlier in the service uh, this morning as well. And thanks for sharing her story with us. Uh, glad you're here this morning as we gather. And I just want to say again to you, uh, love what you all do here uh, at Generations, how you stay engaged. Love that you're down in Fort Myers and, and uh, Port Charlotte helping out right now. Uh, I got to see Johnny uh, briefly uh, just as the storm was coming in, I help uh, host a network called Spire, uh, which connects uh, thousands of pastors around the country. We have an annual conference. It was in Orlando, uh, and it uh, uh, happened while uh, the hurricane was coming in. And so ended up uh, having to shut the conference down on Tuesday after a day. I know you all were still uh, under, under uh, not sure where that storm was going to head into as Tuesday came. And, and uh, then I got stuck in Orlando with all the flooding for several days. Um, and we lived in Fort Myers. Dine and I, uh, our first uh, two kids, our two oldest, were born down there. And uh, so many friends uh, who've been impacted in such phenomenal ways. Uh, one of our pastor friend's house uh, is flooded. They're still not back in there yet. You've seen some of the damage, particularly down by Sanibel and, and Estero Island. It's just uh, terrible. And I love that you all are leaning into that and helping out. And uh, I want to take a moment and pray uh, for those folks who were impacted so significantly by the storm and first responders and uh, all of those now who are pouring in to uh, help in the recovery. Let's take a moment and pray together. Father, just thank you for uh, the privilege we have to gather in this place and be reminded of your goodness and grace, uh, your love extended to us. And Father, I pray that 
uh, you would be with those families who lost loved ones in this storm and the heartache and grief they're experiencing, others who lost their businesses or possessions, their homes, and, and uh, Father, just, just all the devastation that goes with that in this long recovery, uh, long after it comes off the news cycle and those of us who live in other parts of the country uh, have forgotten what's happened. Uh, Lord, people will be dealing with the, uh, the effects of this storm. Thank you for the first responders who are there and uh, for those who are down uh, bringing power back and construction back in and cleanup and uh, help, help and bring resources. And thanks for the folks here at Generation who are using their time to help out. And so, Father, I just pray that you would bless those people, bless their families as they're away serving like this. Uh, Lord, as we gather, we come from different places today. We've had different stuff going on this week. Things we're anxious about, stressed over. I pray that you'd meet us in the middle of our things and allow you to speak into our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're in the series on 40 Days of Prayer, and uh, I hope you've joined a group. If you haven't yet already, there's still time for you to plug into a group. I hope you have the resources for this um, uh, that the church is providing. Uh, and, and here's the hope, that if you spend the next 40 days uh, praying and connecting with God, uh, you'll develop a new habit in your life. Uh, 55% of people in America say they pray uh, nearly every day. 84% say they pray regularly. And yet for most of us, prayer is, is, is sometimes difficult or tough for us. It's not always easy for us. Um, and, and we get uh, distracted. You know, sometimes we'll say, well, I don't really know how to pray. Um, a little boy was with his mom. They had invited 30 people over for Thanksgiving. The house was crowded and busy, and they finally got the meal together. They were sitting down, and, and mom said to her son, her young son, hey, would you say the prayer for dinner? And he said, mom, I don't know how to pray. And he, she said, well, just pray like I would pray. So he bowed his head, and he said, dear God, why did I invite all these people? You know, sometimes our prayers are like that, or we know the mealtime prayer, right? Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yay God, right? We get... But prayer is when we connect with God. Prayer is, uh, is when we find a way uh, to open our hearts to him and to invite him into the middle of our stuff. Now, I wouldn't assume all of us are Christ followers, but faith journey can be challenging, can be really challenging sometimes. An Angela Duckworth, in her uh, best-selling book, Grit, she was a researcher, a mathematician. She studied thousands of people, and here's what she said. She said that she found that people that were successful, it wasn't based on their IQ or even their skill set. She said there were two things that were common in successful people, that they had passion and perseverance, and she called it grit. When you read through the Bible, you see all of these followers of God who went through incredibly difficult and challenging times. And the one whose faith, who, who, who stayed so connected, who grew, even through the challenges, had passion and perseverance. And I'm convinced that we need a gritty faith. And I think prayer is what underlies that for us. You know, I live out in Colorado, and we live near Estes Park. And, and we love to go up and hike in the mountains and and uh, take advantage of that. And when my kids were younger, I think my, my boys were like eight and nine, maybe nine and ten. Uh, uh, our youngest, Chelsea, uh, their sister, is five and a half years younger uh, than, than the boys. And so it was always a challenge for us to find stuff to do that we could all do together, right? And so we're up there hiking, and we're doing a kind of difficult trail. It was probably three or four miles back in and had some elevation gain to it and got above the tree line and eventually uh, came out into one of the lakes that are just gorgeous up there in the mountains. And so we were about a half a mile into the hike and my three-year-old uh, Chelsea had all the fun she wanted to have. And she was done. So we had a backpack that we put her in and now I'm carrying her up this hill. And, and carrying like a pack is one thing, carrying a pack that is squirming and moving and crying and playing eating graham crackers, dribbling down in your hair and on your neck and, and resting her elbows on your head because she's bored. That can be, like, tiring. So we're getting almost all the way up to the top, and the boys uh, wanted to run up to get to the lake, and so I got Chelsea out of the pack so she could do that last 100 yards with them, and they get up there at the lake, and the boys are high-fiving, and we did it, we did it, and Chelsea's dancing with them. I did it, I did it.
You did not. <laughs> I carried you all the way up this. You did nothing. You didn't rode along. You were enjoying the scenery. You even ate my graham crackers. Yeah. No, it was better than that. But the truth is, right, she didn't do anything to get up that hill. And here's what I'm convinced of. In this journey of faith, it takes passion and per perseverance. And I think prayer undergirds that for us. And along the way, uh, in our prayers, we find that God is actually carrying us in this journey. And I love that you're doing this series. Because when you look at the people of the Bible, they prayed. Listen to David's prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Oftentimes, we are reaching out to God when we need help. In fact, uh, most times, our prayers are often centered around when we're about to have trouble. And when a crisis comes, we pray. These people right here aren't praying yet, but they're getting ready to pray. Look at this. Maybe this. Okay. You wouldn't have liked him anyways. <laughs> you know, prayer can be this challenge for us. And how we approach prayer matters. Richard Foster in his book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's Home, talks about prayer in three ways. He said, first of all, there are those inward prayers. Prayers that, that are about us and our connection to God. And then he said, there are those outward prayers. And those prayers are prayers about God, thanking him for who he is and what he's done and the relationship we have with him and honoring him and worshiping him. Part of our worship is actually like words of prayer and honor back to God. And then there are those upward prayers, those prayers that we offer up on the behalf of others, that we're praying for them and uh, their needs and and I find myself wanting to pray for others, but not always being doing that the best. And there's an app I use called uh, Prayer Mate, which is great because I can plug in all my contacts and, and I can uh, plug in my family and say, okay, on these days, I want to be praying for these things and these people. And it loads my contact list in so that every day I'm praying for five of my friends. And, and uh, it's been a useful tool to help me with that. My wife started a bunch of years ago, Diane started a thing where all of our Christmas cards that we get, uh, we keep, and then beginning in January, on the 1st of January, we pull a Christmas card or two every day and pray for those people. And we'll text them and, uh, or call them, email them, and ask them, is there anything specific we could pray for? And what it allows me to do is take my prayers away from my middle school self, which is always about me, what I want, what I need, what's going on in my life, and Turn it toward God and turn it uh, praying for others. You know, Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed at least 25 times we have recorded prayers of, of Jesus praying. Uh, times when Jesus was going away to pray. At least 25 times we said in the Gospels, the Gospels tell us the story of Jesus. And one time his followers said to him, teach us to pray. And here was his prayer. This is then how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's not a very long prayer. It's not a complicated prayer. But look what Jesus does in this prayer. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to unpack it even further. First of all, he shifts the focus. The focus is on God. Our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, God, you're holy, you're beyond us, and yet you allow us to come to you. And your kingdom come and your will be done. It is about what God is doing before he ever gets to anything about us. That focus on God. Your understanding of what God is like influences everything else about your faith journey. How is it you see God? You know, for a lot of people, they view God how they saw their parents. If you had a good relationship with your parents, or you had a tough relationship with your parents. Or, or for many of us, we see God as, as kind of like this, this cosmic cop. You know, he's got his radar gun, just waiting to see us go a mile or two over the speed limit. Or we see a grumpy God. You know, he's up there kind of just, oh, he's rising, rising people down there. Or maybe the crouching tiger kind of God, just waiting to pounce on you the first time you do something you're not supposed to do. Or maybe you see him as, as kind of a, a flaky father God. 
Sometimes he likes you, sometimes he doesn't. You're not sure what you did either time to make that happen. Or maybe you see the Santa Claus God, you know, the one that's keeping the list. What's been naughty, what's been nice. Maybe sometimes we we see God as a dictator God, demanding more from you, but giving less to you. How is it that you see God? A.W. Tozer, a theologian, said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What's the Bible say about God? It tells us that he's all-knowing, omniscient, and that he's all-present, he's everywhere, omnipresent, and, and that he's all-powerful, omnipotent. But I love how we hear about God in the Scripture. The Bible tells us that God is holy and he's just and he's faithful and he's loving and he's kind. The psalmist says it this way, the Lord is always good. He's always loving and kind and his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. Your picture of God shapes how you pray. Because God is always good, God's plans for my life will always be good. As you're in this 40-day journey, you're going to follow this outline uh, here in, in your small group. Because God is always good, God's plans for my life will always be good. Now, that doesn't mean, here's a caveat, that doesn't mean that our life is going to be trouble-free. In fact, Jesus said we're going to experience some trouble in our lives. But here's what the prophet Jeremiah said. I know what I've planned for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. My plans will give you hope and a good future. And when you call to me and pray to me, I will listen to you. It doesn't mean that everything in our lives are going to go good. Sometimes a hurricane blows through and destroys our stuff. Sometimes you and I end up not experiencing the goodness of God because we aren't inside his plans in our lives. Sometimes that happens as a result of our own choices. Some of the bad stuff that happens to you and me is because it's what we choose, some decision we made. And so we live with the woulda, coulda, shouldas. We live in that sea of regret. We live with the, I wish I hadn't done that. But now you're living with some, some junky stuff in your life because of some decisions you made along the way. Sometimes the bad stuff in our lives happens because somebody else chooses something. It's what they did, how they acted or responded in ways that they hurt us or harmed us or created difficulty for us. And sometimes the bad stuff in our life happens because we live in a broken down world and a category four, almost five hurricane instead of coming slightly further north and hitting Tampa takes a turn and wipes out part of Fort Myers. We live in a busted world. But God still wants good for us. He invites us into his story. I love the verses, and these have been kind of life verses for me for almost 40 years now. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works that any one of us boast. In other words, God extends his grace and love to me. I've shared with you before that I was the first Christian in my family, and we can go back a long ways before uh, we discover any other uh, Christians. In fact, we don't really know of any. And, and you've heard me say, you know, we have, we have trouble getting family reunions because we can't get parole dates to line up. And every time a new relative would show up, it was never good news uh, in our family. And, and finally, I figured out our name is a chopped down name of a French name. And I had hope that, ah, somewhere back there, but we found out it was three brothers who were horse thieves, had to flee France, came to Canada first, and migrated down into the U.S. It's never getting better. And when I first heard that there was a God who loved me and invited me into a story, that my story could change, and he wanted me to be a part of his story, for by grace you've been saved, not because I deserved it, not because I earned it, not somehow because I earned a good, good enough points, I did enough good things that God finally goes, oh, good, hey, Ricky, pat you on the head. It is by his grace. Grace. And if Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is true for you, and I'm not going to assume it's true for all of us, but if it's true for you, then so is the next verse, verse 10. And here's what he says. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do what? Good works. 
that God had prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, God's already has a part of his story he wants you to be a part of. When the prophet Jeremiah, God is saying through the prophet that I have plans for you, plans to help you, not to harm you, plans that are good. God has prepared a part of his story that he wants to have you help write to be a part of the good things he's prepped. My uh, driver's ed teacher in upstate New York, nice guy, we get in the car the first time and uh, we're chatting up. Two of my friends are in the back seat. I'm driving first and, and uh, you know, you're nervous. Like, you, I mean, it's just a nervous thing when you got somebody like, you're like, like trying to remark on your driving. And he was giving me instructions about not getting too close to other cars and not following along. And I thought I already kind of knew how to drive. And we were coming up to an intersection with a stop sign. And I guess I was going too fast, which has tended to be stuck with me. And we're getting closer to the stop sign. And he said, hey, slow down, Rick. Slow down, Rick. And then he yelled like at the top of his lungs, stop. It scared the life out of me. I panicked and hit the gas pedal straight right through the intersection. He had me pull over. I didn't get to drive for the rest of the lesson that day. And, and he said this, Rick, always pay attention to intersections because good things and bad things happen at intersections. I wonder how many of the good things God had prepared for me to do that I had my head down, so focused on me, so focused on my situation, my circumstances, my stuff, that I blazed right through an intersection and missed out on maybe where God had an opportunity for me. This week, all week long, you're going to have intersections, connections with some other people, opportunities that will come your way, choices you get to make. And pay attention at those intersections because there may be some good things, an encouraging word, helping somebody, uh, taking a risk, choosing to get engaged, somebody, seeing something you hadn't seen before, hearing something you hadn't heard before, maybe allowing God to speak into your heart and your life. If you don't get so head down focused on your own stuff, you miss out on the good things he has. Now that doesn't mean everything in our life is good. The Bible says that things work together for good. One of the times I was here recently, I shared with you that my sister, when she was 18, was killed in an auto accident uh, the week before Christmas. She was a senior in high school. She was in a wedding with some friends, and uh, that evening, uh, she and my wife's sister, uh, Danette, were in the car, headed back over to their friend's house, early, uh, late afternoon, early evening, and uh, some guys who'd been at a party uh, uh, crossed the center line, and uh, drunk drivers, and my sister was killed in that accident. So were the two from the other vehicle, and Diane's sister was the only one who lived. That was hard for our family. We hadn't been Christians very long. And all these years later, when I look back, that wound is still memorable, and it's still a part of our family's journey, and, and nothing about that was good. And if we could redo it, I think we would. But out of that, God's done some good things. My mom and dad have actually lost three uh, children. My mom got involved in grief counseling, went and got certified, and for uh, a long time has been doing grief counseling, even now in her 80s, helps out a lot of people who are going through that grief journey. My dad would often reach out to strangers who'd lost a child in an accident and just come alongside them in their journey. Uh, Diane and I... Um, um, we had been dating uh, before this, and uh, sometime when she's here, uh, we'll tell you the story of why we weren't dating. I have a different version than the version she tells uh, about that, but uh, we, we actually didn't like each other. Hate would be a, a pretty accurate term. And, but her sister's in the accident. My sister was killed in that accident. She was in St. Louis. I was in Cincinnati. We both flew home. It was a Saturday night. We both flew home early the next morning. I'm now at my house when she and her family come over to our house to see my parents. I went in one room. She went in the other room. I went in a room. She went. We just avoided each other. That year, I was flying in for Christmas Eve, um, and I was going to be home until two days after Christmas, and then I was going back to Cincinnati. I was also supposed to travel for the college I was attending uh, that summer, so I was not going to be back home in uh, Syracuse any time at all. Um, we got uh, to the funeral on Wednesday 
After the funeral, my parents wanted to go and see uh, Diane's sister in the hospital. She was in ICU. We get up there, and they were only allowing two people at a time in the room. So Diane and I got stuck in this little waiting room together. And we just chatted. We were cordial to each other, and both in the midst of this personal tragedy. And, and uh, she invited me to uh, get together um, just to chat about our families and what was happening. And, and we did over the Christmas break. And then uh, that summer, I came home uh, because, because I wanted to be with my folks uh, during that time. And uh, Diane and I really re- reconnected. And now, 42 years later, God's blessed our relationship. And we often wonder if that tragedy hadn't happened, if we'd have been given the opportunity to reconnect. I'm not saying it was good. I'm saying that things that can be good can come out of our difficulties. Never waste a hurt. Because God can use that to bless you and maybe to bless others. God is always good and his plans for my life will always be good because God is always good. God always gives me what I need, not or what I um, need, not what I deserve. The psalmist says this, he has not treated us as we deserve for our sins or paid us back for our wrongs. In his goodness, he has taken our sins away and removed them as far as the east is from the west. God extends his goodness to me, takes all your sins, throws them out in the deepest sea and posts a no fishing sign. Hey, he's saying to you, hey, get past your past. He's saying to you, I want to forgive you. I want to extend grace to you. I love how the psalmist says, in his goodness, he has taken away our sins. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. And yet most of us in the room feel like we got to earn God's love. And I find it true even among Christ followers. We still feel like somehow I'm just not good enough. Good Housekeeping said 84% of us believe that the circumstances in our life and our choices determine on whether God's going to bless us or not bless us. God extends his grace to us. I, I told you that I sometimes drive a little fast, so I have the opportunity to meet people I have a great respect for, police officers. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, I've been a chaplain. I try to help out. I always carry donuts in my car just in case, just in case. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and recently, uh, I, I got pulled over uh, again. Um, and uh, uh, I, 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 I start right away with, hey, how are you? You know, I really respect you guys. I admire you. And, I, you know, I try, and, and, you know, a lot of times they're, they're kind to me. But let's suppose when the police officer comes up, let's say out here on Little Road, I get pulled over for speeding a little later. And, uh, and the police officer walks up and says, you know, you're going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. And uh, the fine for that's going to be $250. And I have to give you a, a ticket. And he writes me out a ticket. And then I got to pay the fine. What is that called? That's justice. That's justice. I was speeding. I deserve the ticket. It's my fine. I'll get the points. My insurance will go up. I got six more months before it comes back down. True story. <laughs> what if he walks up and says to me, you know, hey, I, 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 you know what? Tell you what. I don't really want to take time to write this ticket. And you seem like a nice guy. I'm just going to give you a warning. Don't speed anymore. Go ahead and go. What's that called? That's called being lucky. No, no, no. That's... <laughs> That's mercy. That's mercy. But let's suppose he walks up to the ticket and says, you know, you're going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit and you deserve a ticket and the fine for that's 250 bucks. But here's what I've done. I have put the ticket in my name. I'll take the points. I'll pay the fine. You know what that's called? Nuts. That's called nuts. No, that's grace. That's what God does for us. It's not that the penalty is just waved off. It's that God takes it for me. Because God is always good, he puts my good above his own good. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. And I will sacrifice my life for the sheep. Jesus takes on my sin, my guilt, my penalty. And I get his goodness. The king becomes the sacrifice. Last week we were at Disneyland. Our oldest granddaughter, Addie, 
uh, her dance troupe was in the parade. And uh, so we, our, our whole family went out. All our grandkids were there, all, all eight of our grandkids. And we had a great time. From two to 13, it was awesome. And two of my granddaughters were dressed up as princesses because that's what they love. And they were, I mean, we were having a marvelous time. And, and you know, when you're there at Disney, it's always about the princess or the queen or the king, right? Um, I have an office in London, and, and my friends over there uh, grieving the loss of the queen. who was such a remarkable, faithful person. And God saved the queen. God saved the... Do you know Christianity, the Bible's the only... The only story where the king dies for the peons. The peons aren't trying to save the king. They're not sacrificing for the king. The king sacrifices for me. God gives up his own good for me. Because God is good, he doesn't say yes to every request. God's not a genie in a lamp. He's, he's not some vending machine. He's, he's not Amazon Prime on steroids. He... He sometimes doesn't say yes to my request. When our grandkids spend time at our house, when they're spending the night, I guarantee you they don't get everything they want. If they did, they would never go to bed. We'd eat Cocoa Puffs for every meal, and they wouldn't have to go to school the next day. Sometimes God says yes, and sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says, you've got to be kidding me. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish to eat, would you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, would you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give to those who ask? What I notice for me is that too often my prayers are like a, a grocery list of things I want. And I'm not often praying, but God, what do I need to be a part of your story? What do I need about how I'm a better follower, a better spouse, a better dad, a, a better human? Because God is always good. He invites us to live with him forever. That invitation that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loves us has given us by his grace an everlasting encouragement and a good hope that will last forever. And may this encourage your heart and give you strength for every good thing you do and say, God invites us on this journey. I think the faith journey takes some grit, but he also invites us that we're not gonna do that on our own. And so there's gonna be a day when we draw our last breath and we're gonna rise up over that hill and there's gonna be that beautiful lake, that sea. And I'm gonna stand there jumping up and down. I did it, I did it. And I think God the Father is gonna come over and say, of course you did. <laughs> of course you did. And when I pray, my life aligns better with God. And when I pray, I love better. And when I pray, I serve better. And when I pray, I can get the focus past me and get invited into a much bigger story. So you know the prayer. Some of you grew up memorizing this prayer. I didn't, but many of you did. And we've learned it from a variety of traditions. The Lord's Prayer. When Jesus' followers said to him, teach us to pray, he gave this very simple, not long prayer, but so powerful. Would you stand with me? The words are gonna be on the screen. And let's say this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation. And forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.